bone by bone, bit by bit, Craig Derstler and his team are reconstructing the life and times of some of the last dinosaurs to walk the earth. For Dale Russell, Dragon's Grave provides the first detailed information on Troodon's habitat, its food resources, and the other creatures who share this environment. Today, excavations are focused on a bone bed filled primarily with the remains of hadrosaurs, huge duck-billed dinosaurs. The species that thrived here at Dragon's Grey was Edmontosaurus, a plant eater. It stood six meters high and weighed three or more tons. Vast herds of Edmontosaurus once roamed this landscape, and somewhere out there, Troodon was living. Some 65 million years ago, in an age called the Cretaceous, the dinosaurs reached their peak. A dazzling array of species occupied every possible environment. Back then, Dragon's Grave was a river delta teeming with life. Herds of Edmontosaurus grazed the vegetation that grew near the water's edge. Occasionally, a monstrous T-Rex would crash through the swamps and kill one of the large duckbills. Others succumb to old age or disease. As they died, Edmontosaurus were washed into the water. In time, their bones became part of the natural levees that formed throughout the delta. A living example of this environment is the swampy ecosystem of Louisiana, Craig Dersler's home state. The natural levee deposit that you can see immediately behind me is the kind of environment where the duckbill bones were accumulating. All you have to do is take this sediment, the bones which would have been incorporated inside, the plant debris, which is very obviously growing and accumulating in this area, and put the duckbills into it as well, put the troodons in, and voila. The environment is virtually identical to what it was like 65, 66 million years ago when Troodon was roaming, living, taking care of its young in Wyoming. Dastler sees Troodon as the dinosaur equivalent of a cunning present day predator in the Louisiana bayou. If you look for an analogy in terms of not just what they ate, but in terms of their functional abilities, in terms of their intelligence and so on, the best analog that we can find are coyotes. And that's one reason why troodons are sometimes referred to as coyote dinosaurs. They're cunning, they're quick, they solve problems rapidly, they modify their behavior at, a, at the drop of a hat. It seems reasonable to push that for troodons as well, because in this environment, in this, in this late Cretaceous, Southern Louisiana here, that we have here in Wyoming, you have troodonts as small, nimble, and the most intelligent creatures in the area. Like a two-legged coyote, troodon flourished in the rich environment that was Dragon's Grave. The natural levee that the troodonts apparently were living on when they got incorporated into the bone bed uh, was certainly one of those supermarket or grocery store environments with all the plants all the insects that were there, certainly all the small animals that were available, certainly the duckbill, or possibly the duckbill carcasses as well. Uh, it was just a great place to live. It was a great place, certainly, to raise young as well. Because of the, because of the uh, slight elevation on the natural levees, it was also a great place to, uh, for mothers to watch out for danger when they were taking care of the young. Troodon mothers may have laid their eggs near the banks of the levee, where the carcasses of duckbills piled up. In this way, Troodon young would have hatched to a ready source of food. The adult Troodon probably fed on a variety of fare. Plants, insects, and our ancestors, the early mammals. During the Cretaceous period, mammals were small insect eaters whose sole refuge was the night. Most large killer dinosaurs had poor night vision. Then Troodon arrived on the scene. A 
Little escaped its acute eyesight, its nimble, grasping hands. The mammals had nowhere to hide. Master of the dark, Troodon may have posed a greater threat to mammals than any other predator on Earth. The coyote dinosaur might eventually have slowed the evolution of mammals to a dead stop. We will never know, for Troodon was suddenly cut down in its prime. This dinosaurian community, with, in its, really in its flush of youth, was also a final expression of the beauty of the dinosaurian world because just after the moment in time represented by this locality, a great extinction swept the surface of the Earth. Scientists have yet to solve the mystery of the dinosaur's demise. Asteroids, volcanoes, or viruses may be to blame. Only the outcome is clear. 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs were gone. But the story of Troodon does not end here at Dragon's Grave. It launches us into the future, from the dinosaur age to the space age. The extinction of the dinosaurs ushered in a new era in Earth history, the age of the mammals. The descendants of Troodon's tiny prey now rule the planet. But was the rise of our kind predestined? Or could the evolution of life have taken a different course? What would have happened if the mass extinction hadn't occurred? Uh, mammals had been suppressed or, or limited to the small body size all through the Mesozoic. Now we have these small theropods moving in, um, certainly competing with mammals, certainly or almost certainly preying on the mammals that, that were comfortable for a period of time. If the extinction hadn't occurred, um, you can project this one step farther. Perhaps, perhaps these small theropods would have completely pushed the small mammals aside. Um, at the very least, they would have kept them from ever getting large. Natural selection had favored Troodon's acute vision, its grasping hands and keen intelligence. What if it had continued evolving? Dale Russell would answer that question by projecting Troodon into a hypothetical future where dinosaurs had never become extinct. He was prompted by a group of scientists interested in the evolution of life, but not on Earth. Experts at NASA were looking into a research project based on a bold proposition that life might exist elsewhere in the universe. They asked Russell to calculate the odds that it might be intelligent. NASA was sponsoring a project called the Search for Terrestrial Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and they wanted to evaluate the probabilities of organisms appearing in extraterrestrial biospheres um, of arising and constructing a civilization and technology adequate to build radio telescopes to communicate with us across space. As a paleontologist, they asked me to please, uh, would you, Dale, review the evidence of the uh, evolution of the brain and organisms, the central nervous system through geologic time. Russell reviewed brain-to-body ratios as they evolved through time. Before the extinction of the dinosaurs, mammals and troodon had similar body-brain proportions. In theory, both had equal chances of becoming more highly evolved. 65 million years ago, Troodon was full of potential. Given another eon or two, it might have looked like this. The dinosauroid, a hypothetical creature, 
humanoid in form, reptilian in biology. Hands like ours, skin like a snake's. Brain like ours, eyes of a dinosaur. A dinosauroid mother would have given live birth, as do some species of snakes and lizards today. But with no mammary glands, she would have regurgitated solid food for her baby. Dale Russell created the dinosauroid by calculating how Troodon's skeleton would have changed if its brain had grown to the relative size of our own. The eyes are focused more directly toward the front than they are in the dinosaur, so it probably would have had stereoscopic vision, as, as we happen to. The face is shortened. It has hands which it uses as tools and feeding devices rather than a jaw. The backbone is vertical. The pelvis is rotated beneath it. And it is our feeling, especially in view of the tremendous success of our own species and the bioengineering that it represents, which is the wisdom of millions of years, derived from a creature, incidentally, which is like a shrew and four-legged. Um, we feel that this is a expectable, viable body form in our thought experiment. And it, it's actually a creature that departed from an ancestor which was bipedal, had a hand that was, had an opposable finger in it, had partly stereoscopic vision, and indeed the dinosaur looks more like us than our own ancestors did. Had the dinosaurs survived, a creature like this might have built great cities, created works of art, and gazed at the stars, questioning the meaning of it all. of what we define as human consciousness may have smoldered in a small dinosaur 70 million years ago. The fate of Troodon carries a message for our kind. But for a fluke of evolution, we might not be here. And scientists with emerald skin would study the bones of ancient mammals, wondering what they might have become. Thirty miles south of Beijing, in China's most famous archaeological site, Shokoshan, or Dragonbone Hill. In this cave, dozens of extraordinary skulls and bones have been unearthed, dating back a million years to a time when our ancestors were not yet fully human. Scientists call them Homo erectus, upright man. Although Homo erectus has also been found in Africa and Europe, anthropologists have fiercely debated for almost a century where these early Asians came from and whether they belong on our modern family tree. But they do know what Homo erectus looked like, based on the skulls that have been found. Their eyes were set far apart under a massive brow ridge. Attached to the brow were thick muscles for chewing, which moved the formidable jaw. The size of the jaw and the teeth, 25% bigger than our own, reveal that Homo erectus probably relied on their teeth as tools to grip and pull objects such as animal hides. Simple stone tools showed that Homo erectus was also intelligent. The skulls vary enormously in size, falling in the range of humans today. What ideas were kindled in the minds of these rugged-looking forebears? What sort of world did they face in the China of half a million years ago? Back then, much of the Earth's climate was colder and drier. The seas dropped by up to 300 feet, exposing land bridges like the Sundai Shelf that linked the Indonesian islands to mainland Asia. 
much of southern Asia was covered in tropical rainforest. The discovery of extinct elephants throughout Indonesia indicate there were open areas where large animals could graze. The stone tools found with Homo erectus suggest he was a hunter and would have been attracted to big game. But he faced stiff competition. Not only were there elephants, bears, leopards, tigers and rhinos, but also saber-toothed cats, ferocious cave lions with huge teeth used to tear its prey apart. Many erectus bones from Asian cave sites bear gnawing marks, suggesting their owners were dragged to the cave as victims of these fierce predators. But where did these primitive humans come from? Did they originate in Asia or migrate from somewhere else? The trail of clues began in Indonesia, where the very first skull of Homo erectus was found by an adventurous Dutch anatomist, Eugene Dubois, back in 1891. Prospecting for fossils along the banks of Java's Solo River, Dubois unearthed a thick skull cap, which he was convinced belonged to a primitive human. At first, his finds were ridiculed, so he hid the bones under the floorboards of his home in Holland. In 1936, German anthropologist Ralph von Königsfeld visited Dubois in Holland, examined the fossils, and decided they were authentic. Von Königswald returned to Java the following year, determined to find a well-preserved Homo erectus skull, and he succeeded. This time, nobody doubted that this rugged skull with its beetle brows and massive jaw belonged on the human family tree. Other skulls eventually surfaced in Europe and Africa. The most spectacular was on the shore of Kenya's Lake Turkana. On a boiling August afternoon in 1984, renowned fossil hunter Kamoya Kimyu was out prospecting when he spotted a dark brown fragment of skull. It took five years for a digging team to unearth one tiny fragment after another, but eventually they assembled a unique find, a nearly complete Homo erectus skeleton. Dubbed Turkana boy, he stood about five feet four inches tall, yet surprisingly, he was still only 12 years old when he died. The boy's tall, athletic build is significant, according to leading Homo erectus scholar Philip Reitmeyer. That particular boy uh, weighed perhaps 68 kilos, if he had been able to grow up. That's 150 pounds. Perhaps a good round average for early Homo erectus in East Africa was closer to, to 58 kilos, or about 130 pounds. They were tall people also, uh, certainly quite comparable in those respects to us, to modern humans. Large body size would have conferred uh, an advantage on Homo erectus in that larger people are simply able to cover more territory. Larger primates, larger mammals in comparison to smaller ones uh, usually behave that way, simply cover more territory in search of food. It's likely that Homo erectus was also engaging in more hunting and consuming more meat than its predecessors had done. Meat is a, is a, a highly caloric food. Homo erectus would have been able to meet its energy needs much more efficiently if it were doing some hunting on a regular, more systematic basis than had been done before. Archaeologists think Homo erectus ate more meat because they found the first well-made stone tools, ideal for butchering meat, at erectus sites in Africa. Once early humans knew how to make efficient tools and learn to control fire, they were ready to leave their African cradle and colonize the rest of the world, or so archaeologists have always assumed. The conventional view is that Homo erectus originated in Africa two million years ago. They were the first humans to leave the continent, spreading gradually into the Middle East, Europe and Asia. But in 1994, a stunning series of discoveries threw these old ideas open to question and raised a dramatic new possibility about Asia's earliest humans. The mystery of Asia's earliest humans first emerged at the Shokoshan Caves near Beijing in the 1920s. 
Here emerged the fossils that quickly became celebrated as Peking man, even though many of the bones actually belong to women and children. Archaeologist Russell Shohan specializes in Asian prehistory. When the first skull of Peking man was discovered in 1929, it generated banner headlines in newspapers around the world. Because for the first time, we had truly early man in China. Earlier finds had been made in Java, but this was far north. This was in a cave context, and this also contained artifactual evidence, stone tools. None of those events happened with the finds in Java. This is what made this site so significant. One discovery created a special sensation, the evidence that they had used fire. Thick ash layers at the site of Joko Tien indicate that Peking man had developed the use of fire. The use of fire was an important cultural hallmark in human evolution. It allowed the exploitation of temperate environments. The use of fire, together with a varied toolkit made up of hammer stones, choppers, points, and scrapers, allowed Peking man to live in a much colder environment than any hominid had before. Another sensation was created by the theory that the bones found in the caves were the result of cannibal feasts. The idea of cannibalism at Jokotien was first proposed by the famous German anatomist Franz Weidenreich in 1940. Weidenreich couldn't explain how the bones of Peking man had gotten into the cave. In addition, upon studying those remains, he also was puzzled by the fact that there was a disproportionate number of skull remains to limb bone remains. He came up with the idea that cannibalism was responsible for this occurrence. Today, we know there are natural occurring agents that could have brought the bones into the cave, such as porcupines or large carnivores that made lairs in caves. And we can also analyze the bones of Peking man for cut marks, which would have been present if cannibalism had occurred. So the issue of cannibalism and Peking man at Jokotien is now dead. Digging at Shokotian continued for over a decade from the 1920s to the 1930s. When the Japanese invaded China, the digs director, Franz Weidenreich, decided he would leave for America and take the fossils with him. The fossils arrived at the port serving Beijing on December the 7th, 1941, the day the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Casualties of war, the fossils mysteriously vanished. They were never seen again. But Weidenreich had the foresight to make plaster casts which survived. 14 skulls, 15 lower jaws, and more than 200 isolated teeth, along with over 100,000 simple stone tools. And we have an extensive cultural record consisting of scrapers, such as this one here, which was likely used to scrape out the inside of hides, and choppers, such as this one here, which was used for digging. All of these cultural remains and fossil remains occur throughout the deposits of Jokotien. Dates of these deposits now indicate that Homo erectus spanned the time range from 400,000 years ago to 700,000 years ago at this important site. Important as the Shokoshian fossils are, they are not the oldest Homo erectus fossils ever found in Asia. The quest to discover an older site led Russell Shohan and his Chinese colleagues to organize an expedition in 1991 to a remote part of Sichuan province. Probing a rocky hillside overlooking the Yangtze River, the team began digging inside an ancient collapsed cavern known as Long Upo Cave. 
They unearthed stone tools, extinct animal bones, and the lower half of a human jaw. Recently, these finds were dated to a staggering 1.9 million years, as old as the earliest known Homo erectus finds in Africa. Then in 1994, bones from Java triggered headlines around the world. One skull from Java proved to be 1.75 million years old, while the others were both over one and a half million. Again, the implications were shocking. Erectus in Indonesia was as ancient as any Erectus in Africa. Now, what does this mean? If we want to take it in the perspective of these different hypotheses, we might argue that Homo erectus could have evolved in Asia and spread back into Africa, in a sense which would challenge all the conventional wisdom on the subject. By this I mean maybe the ancestor of Erectus spread out of Africa two and a half million years ago, populated the rest of the old world, and then was subsequently re reintroduced back into Africa at 1.7. This is a rather radical interpretation but it is certainly a plausible one, given the new dates in Asia. In fact, the new Asian dates stir up many provocative theories and questions. If Homo erectus reached China nearly two million years ago, did they evolve into us, Homo sapiens? Or was erectus in Asia a dead end and replaced by a second wave out of Africa, this time fully modern people, the ancestors of China's present population. Such questions have led to one of archaeology's fiercest debates. What was once a dream is now history. From past to present, from fiction to fact, what shapes tomorrow's future? Science fiction very often leads the way to science fact. As today's dreams become tomorrow's reality, what are the new possibilities? Maybe go to a, uh, a hotel in space for the weekend. What's around the corner of the next millennium? Engage. Engage your mind with the Discovery Signature Future Perfect next week at 10 on Discovery Channel. So you think it will never happen to you. But somewhere in Britain, there's a burglary every 25 seconds. That's why your home needs protection with a security system from Extra Watch. Extra Watch puts your home in line to the emergency services 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, so we can take action fast. Systems start from just £99 fully installed, including personal attack alarm. And with a monitoring charge of just 99p per day, that's a small amount to protect your family and home 24 hours a day. Call 0800 955 999 for further information. That's 0800 955 999. Extra Watch. Security for life. suspension has been tuned to reduce tiredness on a long journey. Red or blue? So if you need to arrive fresh and alert, make sure you're driving one. Low? But not as low as the fuel prices at Esso. Breaking update. There's been a new occurrence of the worldwide shrinking phenomenon. Yesterday it was the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower, and we've just received word from London that Big Ben has become Little Ben. Despite rumors, Ericsson denies any involvement, but do admit to the launch of their smallest ever mobile phone that still gives you up to three hours talk time. The Ericsson GF788, so small it will change your perspective. Time out to discover new Viva Color, Weller's first permanent color with a color vitalizer. It uses ingredients found naturally in hair itself to vitalize your hair. The result? Lasting radiant color and brilliant shine. Put the life back into your hair. Add vitality to your life. Discover the secret with Viva Color, new from Weller. 
The Cyclone 6000 hover from Quadcast gives you 6,300 revolutions per minute. Onwards and upwards, hover slopes and banks. We mow the grass so easy, the pivot game of the things. This is no ordinary toothbrush. This is the Braun Oral-B Ultra Plaque Remover. Its high-speed oscillating motion is clinically proven to remove more plaque than a manual toothbrush. Dentists recommend you change your toothbrush every three months. Braun says simply, change your toothbrush. The Braun Oral-B Ultra Plaque Remover. Uh. Um, is this a bad time to ask for a ham sandwich, Dad? Wafer thin ham. Buy one pack, get one free. Let Extra Watch protect your home 24 hours a day from just £99. Call now on 0800 955 999. Why is this mountain the only place on Earth where these unique plants and insects can survive? What makes these tiny cars so much more technically advanced than their thoroughbred cousins? Why do ancient methods often succeed where Western medicine fails? Who made these vast statues, and why? What do they signify? Daytime with a difference on Discovery Channel. Every weekday from 4.30. Food for the brain. Medical Detectives follows Jurassica. Just why did a 12-year-old vegetarian prove so useful to investigators? Half a million years ago, Homo erectus lived in these caves near Beijing, sharing the valley below with deer, horses, elephants, and cave lions. Today, fossil casts of so-called Peking man are kept in the local museum, where anthropologist Russell Shohan compares the skulls of these ancient humans to our own. Here in front of us, we have a typical skull of Homo erectus from Choco Tien. You can see features that are distinctive. It has a very projecting brow ridge. The forehead slopes quite severely back, and it has a nuchal crest at the back. The skull is also flattened, where it is wider at the base and narrow at the top. These features are in striking contrast to what we see in modern humans. In addition to the morphological features of the skull, it has a brain size or cranial capacity roughly two-thirds that of modern humans. At first glance, one is struck by Peking man's primitive appearance. His thick brow ridges and massive jaw indicates that he still relied on his teeth, not refined tools. Can it really be true that Homo erectus belongs to our family tree? It's a tantalizing question, and the evidence at Shoko Chan reinforces the mystery. At one of the caves, skulls were found dating to relatively recent times, just 30,000 years ago. The bones belong to Ice Age hunters who probably spent the winter sheltering in the caves. Are they the direct descendants of Peking Man and the ancestors of the modern Chinese? Physically identical to modern humans, they were definitely Homo sapiens. But did another human branch leave Africa a second time and lead to the population we see in Asia today? In the 1980s, an ingenious technique was developed to trace the genetic history of the world's populations. It involved sampling the genetic material known as mitochondrial DNA, passed down only through the female line. The results showed that all modern humans are descended from an ancestral Eve, a hypothetical mother of us all, who lived in Africa some 200,000 to 100,000 years ago. The theory caused a sensation. Recently, major flaws were exposed in the DNA Eve theory. Yet archaeologists such as Philip Reitmeyer are still convinced that the fossil evidence can only be explained by a great migration of modern humans out of Africa 100,000 years ago. Certainly some of the best evidence as far as modern human origins uh, are concerned 
comes from Africa, particularly from the southern part of Africa. I have in mind a, a cave called Classy's River Mouth on the coast of South Africa. Classy's has yielded a number of human fragments. Unfortunately, uh, the bones are rather badly broken up. There are mandibles with teeth, bits of face, bits of skull vaults, and limb bones also. These materials, insofar as we can check them, are essentially modern in their anatomy, hardly distinct from ourselves. The important point here concerns the age. Classes has been well dated at this point through a number of lines of evidence. Uh, the first occupation at Classes River Mouth dates right back to more than 100,000 years ago. People were resident in the cave for a time after that. Um, this, to my mind, constitutes some of the strongest evidence we have pointing to an African origin for modern people. Wright Meyer and others think that modern humans spread out of Africa 100,000 years ago and that their superior intelligence and technology drove Erectus and its descendants in Europe and Asia into oblivion. But these two researchers disagree. Milford Wolpoff of the University of Michigan and Alan Thorne of the Australian National University are long-time collaborators. For years, they've taken a maverick position on the origin of modern humans. They deny the conventional out-of-Africa theory and argue that modern Asians evolved in a smooth, unbroken line from their ancient roots. All of this took place with evolution that was within East Asia. There's no evidence at all of some new set of people coming in and replacing this whole sequence or even changing it. It is continuous. It comes up to people in Java who've got uh, brain cases that are in the modern range. These people are just as smart as you or me, on into Australia and on into modern people, and in East Asia the same thing. Now, it's a continuous evolution. It's not broken. Once people leave Africa, we don't need a second movement out of Africa. These people are evolving to modernity all by themselves in the sense that there's a local regional group. Of course, they're in contact with the rest of the human world, but we don't need anybody to replace them because they're heading in the modern direction anyway. And that's regional continuity. Put this into several places in East Asia, Southeast Asia, Europe, and in Africa, and you've got multi-regional evolution. Thorne's collaborator, Milford Wolpoff, claims that the evidence from China is particularly strong in their favor. Here's the earliest specimen we know of from China. It's more than a million years old, from a site called Lantian. It's an upper jaw, right here, just like I'm showing on my face, teeth and a piece of cheek. And what you can see here, if you look carefully, is that the face is flat as far as the teeth, and the face is flat where the cheek comes off of the face, and it's very anterior, very much like a Chinese of today. We can find that same characteristic here in this woman from Zhou Chen at about half the age, about 500,000 years. So what this shows is that the roots of the modern North Asians are found in people living in Asia as long ago as a million years. But many, including Reitmeier, disagree with Wolpoff's view that the ancient fossil skulls have characteristics resembling modern Asian faces today. There are a number of such characters which are cited in support of regional continuity in China. The problem is that a number of these characters are distributed into other populations spread all across the old world. They are not limited to the Far East, certainly not just to China. The flattening of the nasal saddle, for example, actually reached their highest frequencies in African populations, well outside of the Far East. Here again, there's a there's a pattern, but it's not the pattern that one would expect to find in support of regional continuity. For Reitmeier, the fossil bones suggest that Homo erectus in China became isolated, a dead end outside the mainstream of human evolution, an archaic form of human swept aside by the spread of modern man during the last ice age. With so few fossils discovered over such an immense span of time, it's not surprising the experts can build conflicting visions of our human past. This is all Homo sapiens. I don't think we need Homo erectus anymore, and it would help us to see our evolution if we call them all Homo erectus. So for me, only one species of human ever leaves Africa, and that's us. That's Homo sapiens. 
I'd be quite happy to get rid of the name Homo erectus. It now has become a name that doesn't have anything that it clearly refers to. The fact is, is that once humans appeared as Homo, as Homo sapiens, they've been human ever since. And I think we could show that by calling them Homo sapiens from the very beginning, some two million years ago. If Wolpoff and Thorne are right, it's extraordinary to think we can trace our origins back directly to those primitive-looking cave dwellers who had to contend with saber-toothed cats. If they're wrong, and the ancient cave dwellers were replaced by a second wave of humans from Africa, then Homo erectus went the same way as the saber-toothed cats. Pushed into extinction after they had survived resourcefully generation after generation for millions of years. Whichever theory turns out to be correct, both represent a powerful evolutionary drama buried in our distant human past. Jurassica returns at 8 o'clock next Friday.